work computer and my phone. <clears throat> okay, we are picking up uh, book six, first chapter, Tower of Kirith Ungol. I believe we got to the end of book five the other day where they meet the mouth of Sauron. He shows them the mithril coat, the uh, sword, the elven cloak and stuff. Gandalf takes those from him, all hell breaks loose, and the chapter ends with Pippin, what's the phrase I want? Being fallen on by a troll. I, I can't think of another way to describe that. And hearing the eagles are coming, the eagles are coming, and he thinks, no, that's Bilbo's story, my story's coming to an end. Um, very briefly, I uploaded the other day, I don't remember when, uh, a revised syllabus. I emailed it to you also. So Thursday, because we're come hell or high water, we're done with Lord, Lord of the Rings today. Um, we're going to do Sorcerer's Stone. Uh, it's going to be like the film version. In other words, we're hitting the highlights and just uh, to get to the end, really. Um, I can tell you right now, a couple of the important chapters. Ooh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. One with the Mirror of Erised. I'm going to spend several minutes on that. Um, Christmas gift, or Christmas at Hogwarts, whatever, when Harry receives some gifts. Um, and then the last couple, you know, through the trap door and things like that. Um, so, Sorcerer's Stone, I'm going to call it by its real name, Philosopher's Stone, from here on out. Um, a week from, could I do this right? A week from today, Chamber of Secrets. Uh, I won't talk to you at all about that right now. And then, a week from Thursday, Prisoner of Azkaban. I'm really going to try not to, but we might... Again, get a little bit behind with these two. Probably not with this one, maybe with um, that one. And then if I can keep those three on those three days, we should be able to cover everything else fairly well. Okay, Tower of Kirith Ungol. Um, I want to pick up pages 900 and 901. So, Sam has realized, we found out at the end of, this is book six, end of book four, Frodo is alive, he's been captured by orcs, and, you know, in his choices of Master Samwise, he did what he thought he would do, he screwed up, essentially. He didn't, literally. If, if his assumption was correct that Frodo was dead, he made all of the right choices, okay? So, beginning 900, 901, actually just a little bit before 900, I think on 899, he takes the ring off and then he puts it back on, okay? And we're told, bottom of 900, um, no sooner had he come in sight of Mount Doom burning far away than he was aware of a change in his burden. What's his burden? The ring. As it drew near the great furnaces where in the deeps of time it had been shaped and forged, the ring's power grew, and it became more and fell untamable, save by some mighty will. Tolkien's foreshadowing there. Just as he gave us foreshadowing in the chapter of the Shadow of the Past. What did Gandalf tell Frodo? About any mortal who possessed one of the rings of power. Not just this one, remember. This is the ring of power, but there are other rings of power. What would happen to any mortal? They would eventually lose. They would eventually be possessed by that ring. Okay? So, the closer and closer this ring gets to where it was forged, the more powerful it becomes and the stronger its temptation to use it becomes. Okay? As Sam stood there, sorry, he's not wearing it yet. As Sam stood there, even though the ring was not on him but hanging by its chain, he felt himself enlarged as if he were robed in a blah, blah, blah. Okay? 
And so, top of 901, now he has two choices. To forbear the ring, not use it, though it would torment him, or to claim it. Already the ring tempted him, gnawing at his will and reason. And notice, again, he's not wearing it. I think the last probably five years or so that I've been teaching this, I've misstated that every time. I said, Sam is wearing the ring when he's having these fantasies. He's not. Wild fantasies arose in his mind. He saw Samwise the strong, hero of the age, striding with a flaming sword across the darkened land, blah, blah, blah. And he destroys Baradur, and he turns Mordor in his dark fantasies into what? Eden. I mean, he just makes it full of, you know, the fruited plain kind of a thing. In that hour of trial, it was the love of his master that helped most to hold him firm. But also, deep down in him lived still unconquered his plain hobbit sense. What is his plain hobbit sense? Tolkien tells us, after the colon. He knew in the core of his heart he was not large enough to bear such a burden. His plain hobbit sense was essentially what? I'm just a nobody. This, this is above my pay grade. You know? This is not for me. Even if such visions were not a mere cheat to betray him. That is, even if those visions were real. That's what that line means. If, even if such visions were not a mere cheat to betray him. Even if the ring could enable him to do all that. Sam says, no. The one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and due. Not a garden sworn to a realm. Have any of you been to England before? Nobody. Well, go sometime. Take a, take a study abroad course. Go to London, OK? You can, get, you can get scholarships and stuff to help pay for it. You get credit and all that kind of stuff. Could you walk around London? I don't mean the city center, the outskirts of London, the suburbs of London. And you see British homes and such. And what Sam is talking about here is the one small garden. Well, that's today kind of what we in America call a yard. They refer to their yards as their gardens. Whether there is an actual garden growing fruits and vegetables or not. If, if it's a green area, it's a, yard, it's a garden. Okay? And most of them, many of them, especially the closer into London you get, they're very small. Like a front yard would be from where I am like this, to that wall and to that wall. That would be it. Okay, That's kind of the impression I think that Tolkien is trying to give us. He's talking a very small garden. Something that one person can, could maintain without overworking. His own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. Tolkien said in one of his letters, it's the title of a book I have in my office, I am in fact a hobbit. He considered himself to be like this, or another way of putting it, he models Frodo and Sam after himself. Okay? So he goes on and thinks, these are all a trick. Okay? He'd spot me and that would be it. So. Sam goes on, and we're going to skip a bunch. What do the orcs do to each other? Kill each other. Kind of works out well for Sam. Okay, Kind of indicates what about orcs? Kind of irredemption or irredeemable qualities. Okay, yeah, I mean, we've already talked about that. What else, though? What are they not to each other? Friends. Friends? 
What else? It's a word we're going to use a lot when we get to these books. Family? No, not necessarily. Allies? What are fr you're getting closer. What are friends to each other? Loyal. loyal. They're not loyal to anyone. But? Exactly. Why do they serve Sauron? Why do they serve Saruman? They're afraid. They're afraid. Because if they don't, what's going to happen? Pain. Torture. Okay? So, Sam rescues Frodo. He does have to kill in the end. Which one? Gorbag, Shagrat, one of the two. 9 11. He, he lets Frodo he's, know he's there. He starts singing. He hears a noise. He goes up the ladder. He finds Frodo essentially in the attic. In 9-11, Frodo says, exact middle of the page, they've taken everything, Sam, everything I had. Do you understand? Everything. He cowered on the floor again with bowed head as his own words brought him to the fullness of the disaster and despair overwhelmed him. Question is, does the despair go away when Sam says, not everything, Mr. Frodo, not everything. The quest has failed, Sam. Even if we get, a, get out of here, we can't escape. Notice, we can't escape. Only elves can escape. There's two different escapes there. Frodo's escape is talking about the escape from Kirith Ungol. The elves' escape is escape from what? Sauron can't go to Valinor. He can't take on the gods, so to speak. Manwe, you know, is way too powerful for him. He's content with ruling all of Middle Earth. The elves can leave. Everybody else? Sayonara. They're essentially toast. Not everything, Mr. Frodo. It hasn't failed. Not yet. In other words, we might still fail, but, you know, there's a, we've got a few more steps to take. I took it, Mr. Frodo, begging your pardon. I've kept it safe. It's around my neck now. Terrible burden it is. And he fumbles for the ring, but I suppose you must take it back. Now it had come to it, Sam felt reluctant to give up the ring. How long has Sam had the ring at this point? A few hours. You've got it. You've got it here? Sam, you're a marvel. Give it to me. Give it to me. What? You can't have it. You know? Here it is. And he pulls it out. And he says, I can share it with you. You can carry it some. I can carry it some. No, no. No, you won't. You're a thief. And then so Soto realizes, Fro Man. Frodo realizes what he said to Sam. Forgive me after all you've done. It's the horrible power of the ring. I wish it had, there we are again, back to, you know. I wish it had never, never been found. Don't mind me, Sam. I must carry the burden to the end. It can't be altered. You can't come between me and this doom. Why not? I think he's right. Why can't Sam come between him and this judgment? That's what doom means. Because Frodo was meant to have the ring. Okay? That's that whole Boethian stuff I was talking about. So, they go on. And we get, see, skipping a little bit. They, you know, kind of ring the alarm bells by going back through. Um, so, let's see here. Page 918. Sam says, Gollum's not dead, let, dead yet. There's still some, some things we have to do. And Frodo says, about a third of the way on that page, look here, Sam, dear lad. I'm tired, weary. I haven't a hope left. But I have to go on trying to get to the mountain as long as I can move. The ring is enough. This extra rate is killed. That is, I can't carry anything else. So they lighten their loads. What's one of the things Sam gets rid of? He's been carrying a cooking stove. 
Not, you know, like a big cast iron, but like a backpacking stove. This whole way. Trash it. Okay? As well as other stuff. Bottom of that page, 918. Frodo says, as I lay in prison, Sam, I tried to remember the brandy one and Woody Inn and the water running through the mill at Hobbiton. I can't see them now. That is, in his mind, he can't even see these images because he's going to tell us, or he already did. No, it's coming up. What does he see? The spinning wheel of fire. That's all he sees when he closes his here now, Mr. Frodo, it's you that's talking of water this time. If only the lady could see us or hear us, I'd say to her, all I want is light and water. A little bit of light, a little bit of water. That's all we need. Just clean water, plain daylight. Better than any jewels. And he says, but we're not likely to get it. Okay? So they go on, page 919. We're told, it's the morning of the 15th of March, but I want to talk about the passage just before that, okay? So it's the morning of the 15th of March, over the Vale of Anduin, the sun was rising above the eastern shadow, and the southwest wind was blowing. Theoden lay dying on the Pelennor fields. Now go up a little bit. A black rider has flown over them, and at the top of 19... 919. They stand up. They look to the left, southward, against the sky that was turning gray. The peaks and high ridges of the Great Range began to appear dark and black. Visible shapes. Why? Light was growing behind them. Without the light, they wouldn't see the form, the shape of the mountains, because it is utter blackness. Now they can't. Light was growing behind them. Slowly it crept towards the north. There was battle. Far above, in the high spaces of the air. I don't think I've literally ever thought about that passage before. Where'd it go? There was battle far above. I've mentioned his name a couple of times. He's the chief of the Valar, who live in Valinor. Okay, He was the chief of the Ainur. Well, take that back. He and Melkor were the highest of the Ainur, the created supernatural beings. Angelic realm, if you want. Okay? My way... Manwe's realm is the sky. The eagles kind of are emblematic, representative of him. Notice where the battle is occurring, that line said. There's something going on, and I think this is also Tolkien's Catholicism coming into place. St. Paul talks about, you know, the battle in the air. Okay? The billowing clouds of Mordor were being driven back, their edges tattering, as a wind out of a living world came up and swept the fumes and smoke, smoked towards the dark land of their home. So Sauron is putting his powers to make this darkness overcome Middle Earth. And now something is coming out of the west and south and pushing that darkness back. It's kind of like a scene. Never made this connection between Harry and Lord Voldemort in book four. We'll talk about that. Under the lifting skirts of the dreary canopy, dim light leaked into Mordor like pale morning through the grimed window of a prison. The description isn't exact, but what else is this image like that we've already seen once before in the two towers? It's when they're in Adaros, and Gandalf raises his staff, and all the light goes away, and then he points to the one little window, eastern window, and a little bit of light streams in. 
And Gandalf speaks to Thanon, and he says, it is not as dark in here as I thought. It's not as dark in here as it was. Look at it, Mr. Frodo. The winds change. Something's happening. He's not having it all his own way. In other words, Sauron's losing. Okay? If, if, should I go there? Yeah, what the heck? Those little bubbles of light between Harry's and Voldemort's wands in book four, if, if you know what I'm talking about, they're going back towards Voldemort. And if you're familiar with that scene in the book, what happens to Voldemort's face when that happens? <laughs> Surprise and fear, okay? I wish I could see what is going on. We're told Theoden lay dying. What else happened? He was taken killed. Sauron just lost his right hand. I can't call him a man anymore because he's not. Wraith, you know. The witch king of Angmar has been destroyed. Then they see a shape moving at a great speed out of the west. At first, only a black speck. The Lord of the Ring race had met his doom. They see him depart. I mean, leave, like Middle Earth, gone. We're going to see the same kind of image when Sauron is destroyed. Excuse me, when the ring is destroyed. We're going to see this giant shadow rise up and then poof, go away. War's going well, okay? So, what notice? Sam wished for, kind of prayed for, light. He got light. 920. They hear the unmistakable sound of the tinkle of water. Bottom of the page. Sam sprang towards it. If ever I see the lady again, I will tell her, light and now water. And then he says, let me drink first. What are both those images, the light first and then the water? They are little eucatastrophes. Little moments of grace that they can't expect to happen again. All right? So, they drink, they go on. We're going to skip a bunch. And if we finish early, we'll go back. Um, chapter 3, Mount Doom. Okay, Bottom of the first page. Sam's standing where he is, and he's looking towards Mount Doom, and he's like, man, that's 50 miles. That'll take a week if it takes a day. With Mr. Frodo as he is, what does he mean? He's exhausted, worn completely down. Okay, 50 miles, nine miles a day. You're not as tall as we are. I've done backpacking trips before where we've done anywhere from nine to about 13 miles a day. And this is hiking in the high Sierras. This isn't hiking in the high Sierras. This is like hiking in a volcanic waste field. Okay, not pleasant. And their legs are like this long. So nine miles a day on little tiny short legs. That's, that's quite the haul, right? Never for long had hope died in his staunch heart. And always until now he had taken some thought for their return. But the bitter truth came home to him at last. And Sam now realizes. At best their provision would take them to their goal. We got enough to get there, but not enough to get back. And when the task was done, there they would come to an end, alone, houseless, foodless, in the midst of a terrible desert. There could be no return. In other words, they would be kind of, kind of. Every analogy, remember, breaks down. Because it's not the same as the thing you're comparing to. They would be kind of like those women left alone in those homes that Aragorn mentioned to Eowyn when no one was left to return, to put on a battle that no one would see or hear about. Frodo and Sam are kind of like that. Even if they achieve the quest, yes, people will know they achieved the quest. 
They won't know any of the details. We'll just die. So that was the job I felt I had to do when I started. To help Mr. Frodo to the last step and then die with him. Well, so be it. But I'd really like to see Bywater again and Rosie Cotton and her brothers. Is this the first time Rosie Cotton is mentioned? Is she mentioned in the chapter about the party or the second chapter? I don't think she is. Mm -hmm. I think this is the first time that we've got any indication that Sam has any kind of romantic interest in anybody. Okay? And the gaffer and Marigold that I can't think somehow that Gandalf would have sent Mr. Frodo on this errand if there hadn't been any hope of his ever coming back at all. So, notice, even though Sam kind of comes to this conclusion, we're going to get there and die, is he without hope? No. No, because he still thinks Gandalf probably thought somehow we'd make it back. Things all went wrong when he went down in Moria. I wish he hadn't. He would have done something. Okay? So, even as hope seemed to die in Sam, as hope died in Sam, or seemed to die, there's that verb again, it was turned to new strength. Sam's plain hobbit face grew stern, almost grim, as the will hardened in him. And he felt through all his limbs a thrill, as if he was turning into some creature of stone and steel that neither despair nor weariness nor endless barren miles could subdue. Why does the narrator tell us that? Stop it. What is, what is happening to Sam? It's like he's turning into the Terminator or the Energizer Bunny. Pick, take your image, okay? No matter what, he's going to get to this goal. Okay? That's why stone takes a long time to wear down stone. With a new sense of responsibility, he brought his eyes back to the ground near at hand. Why near at hand? How do you make a journey of 50 miles? You take a small step. You take a step. How do you stop smoking? You stop that first cigarette. How do you stop drinking? You don't take that drink. How do you stop any kind of vice? By not doing it the next time. Okay? So. They start off again. Okay? They get bundled up. Bundled up's not the right word. Can't think of the word. They march along with some orcs for a while. They ditch them. Page 937. Sam offers to help Frodo carry the ring. And Frodo's like, go away, go away. And then he comes back to himself. Middle of 937. It is my burden. No one else can bear it. It is too late now, Sam, dear. What is too late now? For anybody else to help carry the burden? Yes. What else? For Sam to be able to read you and help. Okay. By carrying the burden. You can't help me in that way again. I am almost in its power now. I could not give it up. And if you try to take it, I should go mad. Okay, no. Look, Frodo has just admitted. They've still got, it's probably safe to assume, at least 30 or 40 miles still to go. And Frodo has just said, I can't give it up. So why the hell go on? What's he going to do when they get to the mountain? Is he suddenly going to... You know, somehow force himself? The quest has failed at this point. When Frodo says, I could not give it up. And if you tried to, I would go mad. Sam nods. Understand. But there's other things we can, and they lighten their load even more. Okay. Take off their orc clothes and such. They keep going. 940. They get to the base of Ordruin, Mount Doom. 
And Sam thinks, or says, now for it, now for the last gasp. He wakes up Frodo, and Sam thinks, I said I'd carry him if it broke my back, and I will. Okay? So he picks up, he says, I can't carry it, but I can carry you in it. What is Sam thinking? What does Sam think is going to happen when he attempts to pick up Frodo? He thinks he's going to feel the weight of the ring. He's going to feel it all. And instead, Frodo's light as a feather. Why? He hasn't been eating a whole lot. He's been walking a whole lot. And? He's fading. He's fading. Even though he hasn't been wearing the ring, he's becoming rape like Okay? Not to wear, you know, Part of it, like they do in special effects in movies, you know, part of it has disappeared, you know. Not like that. So, Sam starts to carry him. And we go on. Page 942. Frodo says, I'll crawl. So they go up the slope, okay? And we get a description of far off in the north where Barad-dur is, far off the shadows of Sauron hung, but torn by some gust of wind out of the world. Notice, a gust of wind out of the world. That is, it, this wind didn't begin in Middle Earth. Mon way again. Or else moved by some great disquiet within, the mantling clouds whirled and for a moment drew aside, and then he saw a rising black, blacker and darker than the vast shades amid which it stood, the cruel pinnacles and iron crown of the topmost tower of Barad-dur. One moment only it stared out, but as from some great window immeasurably high, there stabbed northward a flame of red, the flicker of piercing eye. In other words, Sauron is looking in the exact opposite direction of where he ought to be looking. Why? Because he was gazing north to where the captains of the west stood at bay, and thither all its malice was now bent. What was the final decision of the last debate? We're going to go and we're going to make a big ruckus and bring his eye to us. We're going to attract his attention, okay? And Frodo faints, clasping the ring. 943, he tells Sam, help me, help me, Sam. Help me, I can't stop because his you know, hand's doing this, okay? Ooh, another Harry Potter parallel. Hmm. Don't think I'd ever done that before. Um, Book seven. So, book seven? Yeah, book seven. 943. He helps Frodo. They get up. They start crawling on along again. And suddenly, middle of 943, a sudden weight smote him and he crashed forward, tearing the backs of his hands that still clasped his masters. Then he knew what had happened, for above him as he lay, he heard a hated voice. A wicked master! Wicked master, cheats us, cheats me. No, mustn't go that way, mustn't hurt creations. Give it to me, yes, give it to give it to us now. And Sam rises up, draws his sword, and he looks and he sees Frodo and he sees Gollum. A few lines down, he was a lean, starved, haggard thing, all bones and tight drawn, sallow skin. A wild light flamed in his eyes, but his malice was no longer matched by his old griping. I don't know if that's supposed to be griping or gripping. I kind of think it's supposed to be gripping. Strength. Frodo flung him off and says, down, 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 you creeping thing. And notice, he clutches the ring when he says this. Okay. Out of my path, your time is at an end. You cannot betray me or slay me now. Then suddenly, as before, under the eaves of the Emmy Mule, Sam saw these two rivals with other vision, like, other vision, like when Legolas and Gimli saw Aragorn when Aragorn announces to the writers his real name, like when Pippin sees Gandalf and Denethor in their steering contest. And he sees the majesty, hidden, veiled, and power of Gandalf. So we have this other vision going on. And what does he see? A crouching shape, scarcely more than the shadow of a living thing. A 
creature now wholly ruined and defeated, yet still, excuse me, yet filled with a hideous lust and rage, and before it stood, stern, untouchable now by pity. Okay? Notice that. A figure robed in white, but at its breast a, it held a wheel of fire. Why is Frodo untouchable by pity? The malice of the ring is more powerful. You know, I've, I've, I don't think I've literally ever asked that question before. Because I don't think I've, have, I've ever paid attention to that phrase, untouchable now by pity. I, I think it's because he's overcome. He is entirely in the power of the ring at this point. Why do I think that? I, I don't know that that's true. I could be wrong. Here's why I think that. The very next speech, we're told, out of the fire, there spoke a commanding voice. Where's the fire? It's the wheel of fire at Frodo's breast. At its breast, it held a wheel of fire. Be gone, and trouble me no more. If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. $64,000 question. Who's speaking? Is this Frodo speaking through the ring? Or is this the ring speaking? What was the promise Gollum swore? It says the master is precious. And if he didn't, to be destroyed. That second part kind of came a little later. Okay. The crouching shape backed away, terror in its blinking eyes. Then the vision passed, and Frodo just sees, uh, Sam just sees Frodo standing there, hand on his breath, breath coming in a great gasp, like he's out of breath, almost like he has held his breath while something else spoke. As if. I'm not saying that that happened at all. Sam says, look out, he'll spring, go on, master, quick. And Frodo says, yes, I must go. This is the end at last on Mount Doom. Doom shall fall, you know. And then Sam's like, finally, I get to kill the dirty rotten. Now, at last, I can deal with you. He leaps forward. Don't kill us, Gollum cries. Don't hurt us with nasty, cruel steel. Let us live, yes, live just a little longer. Why just a little longer? Does Gollum think that Frodo's going to destroy the ring? No, I don't think so. I think Gollum knows. The time of the ring, it's coming to an end. For one reason. Lost, lost, we're lost. And when Precious goes, we'll die. Yes, die into the dust. Dust. Kind of like, you know, from dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. <laughs> Have any of you read any stories of immortality or seen films and such about immortality? What is one of the thrusts of many of those stories? No, it's not all it's cracked up to be. It becomes a curse. It is a curse. For most of the stories, those who achieve immortality here eventually come to want to have mortality back. They want to die. In the Silmarillion, death is the gift of Arulaluvatar to men because of what happens to men after they die in women, humanity. Okay. It's not the gift to the elves or the dwarves. When the elves and dwarves die, when the world is remade, this is all in the summer, right? when the world is remade at the quote unquote end of time, humanity is quote unquote 
resurrected. Elves and dwarves, they disappear because they are of the earth. Okay? Gollum kind of is saying, notice, lost, lost. I will die. How old is Gollum? He's over 600 years old. How old should a Gollum, Smeagol, have lived? 70, 80, 90? I mean, for, Bilbo's living to 111. That, that was odd, outside the ordinary. The old took lived to be 130. That was, well, the longest aged ever for a hobbit, okay? Sam's hand wavered. His mind was hot with wrath, the memory of evil. It would be just, go back to Frodo's comments to Gandalf. He is just an enemy and deserves death. It would be just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature, just and many times deserved. And also it seemed the only safe thing to do. Safe brings up a different question than justice or deserving. Safe brings up what issue? Or whose issue? My safety. As long as Gollum's in the area, what? I'm at risk. <laughs> But deep in his heart, there is something that restrained him. Notice, deep in his heart, not in his head, not in his mind. Reason says what at this point? Kill him. Kill him. He could not strike this thing lying in the dust. Forlorn. Forlorn means utterly lost. No hope. Ruinous. Utterly wretched. He himself, though only for a little while, had borne the ring. Now dimly he guessed the agony of Gollum's shriveled mind and body. Notice the agony, the pain, okay? Agony means great suffering. Isn't only in the mind. It's like Gollum's body hurts. You guys are all young. I'm 60. The older I get, the more I hurt. Just like everyday existence. I'm not 600. I can't imagine the kind of pain the body would endure. Enslaved to that ring, unable to find peace of relief ever in life again. Why does Tolkien add those last three words? Notice, unable to find peace or relief. Why doesn't he finish, finish it there? Or, I think you're right, let me throw a, a little twist to that. He's not going to find peace or relief, his cure, in life again. See, I think by introducing the in life phrase, Tolkien is suggesting he might find it elsewhere. After life. In, I don't mean the afterlife, I mean in death. And I don't mean in death the way, if you're familiar with Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials books, Golden Compass, Amber Spyglass, and The Subtle Knife. Okay? I used to teach those. I thought when The Golden Compass came out, this guy's the next Tolkien. I mean, read The Golden it is, it is fantastic. But then you get to the next two books, and his ideological bent takes over. And it becomes, I'm not kidding, Sheer propaganda. He is merely trying to brainwash you into his ideology. Okay? And that ideology partly is when you die, that's it. Your body just disappears. All the atoms go. There is no soul. There is no consciousness. That's all just electrical and chemical things firing off in the brain. That's all it is. And then that's it. Okay? I don't think that's what Tolkien is kind of suggests, curse you, you stinking thing, be off, you know, or I will kill you. And Gollum gets up on all fours and backs away. Sam goes up, 945. He sees Frodo at the very crack of doom, and he cries, Master, 
I have come, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. Notice the pronouns. I, 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 I. Right? But who slash what is really speaking? Frodo is totally overcome. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. Another way of saying that, I think, I could be wrong, the ring is me. I am the ring. And what's the ring doing? Papa, <laughs> come get me. It's the ring crying out to Sauron. And suddenly he puts it on his finger and he vanishes. And Sam gasped. But at that moment, a whole bunch of stuff happens. One, Sam gets knocked down from behind. Frodo's already disappeared. And then he sees far away, as Frodo put on the ring and claimed it, excuse me, far away, 946. As Frodo put on the ring and claimed it for his own, even in Samoth now, the very heart of his realm, the power in Baradur was shaken. No, the power, that's Sauron. It's not like the foundations. What was quick? Why was Sauron shaken? Because he just realized that he made a very big mistake. That was his, oh, shh, moment. Gandalf, you tricked me again, you know. The dark lord was suddenly aware of him, his eye piercing all shadows, looked across the plain to the door he had made, and from all his policies and webs of fear and treachery, from all his stratagems and wars, his mind shook free in what? He realized his folly. The whole-minded purpose of the power that wielded him was now bent with overwhelming force upon the mountain. It's like he's causing the mountain to do something. Ring race, you know, fly. Turn away from whatever direction they were flying, and they all make a beeline for Mount Doom. Okay. Bottom of 946. Frodo sees, uh, Sam sees Gollum, and he's kind of dancing to and fro, hissing, and then all of a sudden he sees Frodo. <coughs> Frodo gave a cry, and there he was, falling upon his knees at the chasm's edge. Gollum dances like a mad thing, holds the ring aloft. Precious, 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 my precious, oh, my precious, precious. Well, what did that ring of fire say? And what did Gollum say? Lost, lost, all is lost. Just a little while longer. Question. Did Gollum intend to fall into the cracks of doom? Did Gollum, what did he swear? He swore, okay, to protect the master of the precious. What did he also swear? Never to allow him, Sauron, to have it again. He swore that on the precious. Frodo said, it will hold you to that. What is the only way, it's a nice addition, by the way, what is the only way for that to happen? The ring has to be destroyed. So the ring holds Gollum to that and Gollum falls. 947. Notice it's not like what happens in the film. The ring doesn't fall, land on a ledge, and they try to get it. Utter Jacksonian stupidity. 947. This is the end, Sam, says Frodo, pale and worn, and yet himself again. In his eyes, there's peace now, neither strain of will nor madness nor any fear. Sam's like, Master, you know, your poor hand, and I have nothing to bind it with or comfort it with. And he says, I would have spared him a whole him, call him, a whole hand of mine rather than. But he's gone now, beyond recall, gone forever. Yes, said Frodo, but you remember Gandalf's words. Even Gollum may have something to do. But for him, Gollum, not Gandalf, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. 
did Frodo destroy the ring? No, he didn't. Who did? Gollum did. So on a grade of 0 to 100, with no curve, how successful was Frodo in achieving the quest? Zero. He didn't. Gollum did. OK, he got the ring to the mountain. We can give him some points With for that. Sam's help. You know, yeah, we'll give him some, some credit for that. The quest would have been in vain even at the bitter end. So let us forgive him. Why? And, and you got it, I think, I could be entirely wrong, probably my own kind of religious background and thinking. I think when Tolkien writes those words, Tolkien's writing those words from a Catholic Christian perspective. Okay. Christ says, and if you're not familiar with it, I'll tell you. Christ says to his followers, if you forgive others of their sins, what will happen? They will be forgiven. Period. There aren't any qualifications to that. If you retain their sins, if you don't forgive them, they won't be forgiven. Right? But then what else? He gives what's called the Lord's Prayer, in which his followers are taught to forgive others how or so <laughs> you will be forgiven. If you forgive others, my Father will forgive you. If you don't forgive others, he won't forgive you. Let us forgive him. I think that is Frodo's comment about Gollum, just like Aragorn's call, comment to Boromir about the great victory he achieved, in that he didn't die tainted. He died redeemed. Why? Because he died for somebody else, Merry and Pippin. Here's the you know real big question that you could spend a lot of time thinking about. Did Gollum die for somebody else? Or did he die solely for himself? And even if he did die solely for himself, if we go to Catholic theological history and look at somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas' words, whether it was entirely for himself or not is irrelevant. His destroying the ring had positive repercussions throughout the world. By the way, the date of the destruction of the ring, anybody know what it is? March 25th. Within the church, okay, both the church, the Catholic Church, like the Orthodox Church, Protestants don't talk about this at all, really. What is this day? Anybody know? What's nine months later? Christmas. So this is. Annunciation. This is when Gabriel comes and delivers the announcement to Mary. Where, where does Mary figure in Catholic thought? She's pretty high up there. Okay? She's like, here's the Trinity, and Mary's right there. All right? Tolkien has the destruction of the ring happen on this day, also because he says in one of his letters, the world, according to a 18th century, 17th century, I can't remember, bishop named Bishop Usher said that the world was created, I think it's like 4004 BC, on March 25th. Okay. What does this destruction of the ring inaugurate? The fourth age, the age of us. That's why there aren't any elves around. Well, maybe there are. You can talk to some people in England who will swear on a stack of Bibles. They've seen elves 
full of nine yards, okay? Aren't any hobbits around anymore, aren't any dwarves, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Here at the end of all things, what does he mean? What's Frodo think is going to happen at this point? Why? They don't have any food, they don't have any water, and what's happening with the volcano? Because it is a volcano. It's starting to spew. And Sam's like, well, you know, we don't have to stay here, right next to the erupting volcano. We could go outside this fissure. So they make their way outside. And they get rescued by Gwaihir the Wing Lord. And we get the fields of Cormallon, which we're going to skip most of. Go to the steward and the king. Long passage, it's at least 30 minutes. Long passage, beginning on 960 and going through 965. We have the, I've never called it this, but I will now. And I'll probably call it this from this time forevermore. The wooing of Eowyn. Faramir and Eowyn are confined to the houses of Helium. Right? Faramir nearly died. Eowyn didn't nearly die. She was grievously wounded. Okay? And we hear Faramir on page 960. Okay. He's in charge of the city because he's the steward and Aragorn's gone. But even though he's in charge, he has to take the orders of the, you know, doctors always get precedence kind of a thing. And he tells the warden of the houses of healing that the Lady Eowyn is to be allowed out on this, like, um, patio to take in the air and, you know, look at the view and all that kind of stuff. And he says, you know, as long as I can come out with you, she's fine. Bottom of 960. She says, how can I ease your care? I, I don't desire the speech of living men. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> how can I make your day go easier? And he says, you want my honesty? Yes. I say to you, you are beautiful in the valleys of her hills. There are flowers fair and bright and maidens fair still, but neither flower nor lady have we seen till now in Gondor. So lovely and so sorrowful. It may be we only have a few days left. So, you know, just being in your presence would be nice for me, you know if you don't mind. He says, we both passed under the wings of shadow and the same hand drew us back. She says, not for me. 961, shadow lies on me still. Look not to me for healing. What's another way of putting that? Look not to me for healing. Look not to me for joy. Look not to me for comfort. I'm not gonna make you feel better. Why? I am a shield maiden, shield maiden, and my hand is ungentle. It's kind of like, come on, buddy. You get too close, I'm going to smack you. But I thank you for this, at least, that I don't have to stay in my chamber. Okay. I will walk abroad by the grace of the steward. So he tells the steward, you know, the warden, what he has to do. Mary goes to Faramir. They talk a bit. Faramir learns much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Faramir sees Eowyn out on that area I mentioned. Let's see here. And just every time he looks at her, he's more enthralled. She reminds him of his mother. Okay. Yeah, Oedipus kind of stuff probably going on there. Um, let's see here. 962. She always goes out and looks in the same direction. So Faramir asks, what are you looking for? Does not the black gate lie yonder? Must he not now be come thither? It is seven days since he rode away. He says, yes, it is seven days. He says, but I, I don't want the world to end yet. Why? Because he's still thinking, I can still, I can still you know, weasel my way into her heart, so to speak. I would not have this world in now or lose so soon what I have found. She says, you know, what have you found? She looked at him gravely, but her eyes and her eyes were kind. 
I know not what in these days you have found that you could lose, but come, stop talking about that. We wait for some stroke of doom. He says, yes, we do. Then they don't talk anymore. Okay. And as they stood, their hands met and clasped, though they did not know it. And still they waited, for they knew not what. And presently it seemed to them that above the ridges of the distant mountains, another vast mountain of darkness rose, towering up like a wave that should engulf the world. And about it lightnings flickered, and then a tremor ran through the earth, and they felt the walls of the city quiver. A sound like a sigh went up from all the lands. And Faramir says, it reminds me of Numenor. Reminds, not that he was there, because he's not that old. But the stories, what would that be like in our world? Some newspapers in the last couple weeks have started publishing things, and you can get on and you can look at them, about what would happen if there were a nuclear device exploded, detonated in your area. Why? Because you've got crazy old Vlad the Impaler Putin talking about nukes. So you can pick Murfreesboro, for example, you can go to this website, you can pick Murphy's Barrel, and you can pick a nuclear weapon, all different kinds of yields. And you can and see how far the destruction goes. And what kind of destruction? You know, the kind where everything's destroyed, and then, you know, just good old ordinary radiation that burns your skin off kind of a thing. Okay? This is kind of like seeing the flash and then feeling the shock of she says, Numenor, and he explains what that means. Then you think the darkness is coming. In other words, you think this means the end of the world. Darkness unescapable. He says, no, I do not know what is happening. He says, something tells me a great evil has befallen and we stand at the end of days. And then he says, Eowyn, Eowyn, White Lady Row on top of 963. In this hour, I do not believe that any darkness will endure. And he kissed them. Okay? And they stand there. And an eagle comes from the west, excuse me, from the east, and cries out, Sauron is destroyed. What is that really? It's little orphan Annie getting up singing, the sun will come up tomorrow. Faramir has something in mind that Eowyn doesn't. He's thinking, yes, more chances to try, you know. 964. He seeks her out again, okay. Her brother sent word, come to the field of Cormallon. This is where the victors are gathering, you know. And she doesn't want to go, and Faramir doesn't go either. And he says, why are you staying here when your brother calls you? Remember what Aragorn said? She loves you, Elmer, more than she loves me. Because how does she love Aragorn? It's the idea of Aragorn. Okay? And she says, you don't know why I'm not going? No. Well, there's two reasons. I don't know which one. I don't want to play riddles. Tell me what you think. Notice she puts all the onus on him. She doesn't say why. So he says, okay, here's the two reasons. One, you don't go because only your brother called for you and not Lord Aragorn. Because <sighs> he, he and his triumph would now bring you no joy. So that's one reason. The other reason is because you want to be near me. And he kind of looks away and plays demure and, you know, downfallen and Eowyn, do you not love me, or will you not? Will implies what? That she's chosen not to. I wished to be loved by another, but I desire no man's pity. And I think when she says, I wish to be loved by another, he kind of you know, probably puts his head down a little. I don't want pity. He's it's not pity. You desire to have the love of the Lord Aragorn. Why? Because he was high and Puissant, meaning powerful, strong. And you wish to have renown and glory and to be lifted far above the mean things. Blah, blah, blah. And he could give you all that. And she looks at him. And he says, do not scorn pity that is the gift of a gentle heart. 
I don't offer you my pity. You are a lady high and valiant, have you yourself won renown, that shall not be forgotten. Because remember, there probably wouldn't be this ultimate victory if she hadn't done what she did. And you are a lady beautiful, I deem, beyond even the words of the elven tongue to tell, and I love you. Once I pitied, once I pitied your sorrow, but now were you sorrowless without fear any like, were you the blissful queen of Gondor, still I would love you. And he asks her again, I believe this is the third time, do you not love me? Then the heart of Eowyn changed. Notice, it hadn't changed before then. It was after he says these lines, or else at last she understood it. That is, her mind and her heart came together. And suddenly her winter passed and the sun shone on her. And she talks and says, here I am standing in the Minas Anor, the Tower of the Sun. Behold, the shadow has departed. I will be a shield maiden no longer, nor vi challenge with the great riders, nor take joy only in the songs of slaying. Okay, notice this change. Get choked up every time I think about it. It's just brilliance on Tolkien's part. I will be a healer and love all things that grow and are, and are not barren. So if she's going to be a healer, what is she going to do? Keep going. Louder. She's going to serve others. The exact thing that she said to Aragorn, I am not a mere serving woman. She is now going to be. Why? Because her heart changed. This is what I talked about a few days ago. This is her conversion. She changes from your prototypical kind of Anglo-Saxon, go for the glory warrior mentality to there is no glory in that. To I will do what? I will help people become Fairmere. That is, she says, I don't want to be a queen. He goes, Whew, you know, that's a, because I'm not a king. You will never be a queen. He says, uh, yet I will wed with the white lady of Rowan, if it be her will, and if she will, then let us cross the river. That is, let's go to the fields of Cormallon. Okay? And she's released. So, skip a bunch. Aragorn gets crowned. Gandalf finds the little white tree sapling, you know, in the buried snow of Mindaluin and such. And, you know, Frodo comes out and carries like a ring, like a ring bearer in a wedding. I, when I was like five or six years old, I was a ring bearer for these people's wedding. Little pillow. Wedding rings were on it. He's the ring bearer, the wedding, you know, ring bearer, so to speak, and the crown bearer for Aragorn and Arwen. Because Aragorn now can finally marry Arwen. Why? What had to happen before that? Sauron had to be defeated. You know, Elrond just put a little obstacle in the way of true love. Okay? Yeah. So, we get many partings. And Arwen gives Frodo a gift. Page 974. She says, I won't go with Elrond to the Havens. Why? I'm making the choice of Luthien. She is going to embrace her human half. The Elvish half will eventually die out. She's going to outlive Aragorn hundreds of years. You, know, it doesn't, you don't just turn off that elf DNA, so to speak. Okay? So she gives him what? Her place at the Grey Havens to go to Valinor. Okay? And she says, You may pass into the West until all your wounds and weariness are healed. 
But wear this now in memory of Elfstone and Evenstar. And she gives them a white gem, like a star, that lay upon her breast, hanging upon a silver chain. And she sets the chain around Frodo's neck. So what has she just done? She's replaced this thing, this white gem, for the ring. Okay. So, they leave, and we're going to skip a bunch. They stop at, they, Gandalf, Legolas, Gimli, Merry, Pippin, Sam, Frodo, I think Aragorn, no, Aragorn and, and um, Arwen have gone back. They go to Isengard. For what purpose? Two, really. To talk to Treebeard and see how Saruman's doing. See if maybe he's had long enough in the prison and is willing to change his mind. Okay. And we find out Treebeard let him go. Why? He didn't want to see him caged. He doesn't like to cage any living thing. You know, he's a he's an environmentalist tree hugger tree. <laughs> he, thing, living things shouldn't be encaged. And he says he doesn't have any more power. And Gandalf's like, yes, he does, Treebeard. And he snookered you. He pulled a fast one on you. So, 983, they run into Saruman. Gandalf asks him, where are you going? What is that to you? Do you still order my goings? Are you not content with my ruin? You know my answers, no and no. No, I don't order where you go around, why? I do not desire mastery. And two, I don't want you to be ruined. The king has taken on the burden, he says, if you had waited or thanked, you would have seen him, and he would have shown you wisdom and mercy. I think that implies, I could be wrong, that Aragorn would have said, you are forgiven. I could be wrong. Then all the more reason to have left it sooner. He says, I'm seeking a way out of this realm. Gandalf, you're going the wrong way. In other words, turn around. Repent. If you want to get out of here. So, will you scorn our help? We offer it to you. Gandalf says again, now you have a last chance. Right in the middle of the page, 983. And he doesn't take it. He does say he would like some tobacco and Frodo says, I'd give you some if I had any. Mary offers him his. Okay? Fair, um, Saruman at this point. Saruman at this point is what? He's a beggar. He's a wanderer. When Frodo says, if I had some, I would give it to you. And then Mary says, I do have some. It's almost like they're giving him alms for a beggar. Okay? Where did he get it from? Sarah Man says, that was mine. Where did he get it from? The Shire. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Gandalf says he can still do some danger. 985. Uh, now we don't need to talk about that. Go on to chapter 7. Homeward Bound. They make their way to Bree. 996, last page of the chapter. And in Bree, they find out what's happening in the Shire. Nothing good. Nothing good. The Shire has been turned upside down. There are roving gangs of men. People have been imprisoned, etc. And they're kind of trying to figure out how all this happened. Bottom of 995, Pippin says, whatever it is, Lotho will be at the bottom of it. Lothville, Lotho, Sackville, Baggins. Okay. Gandalf, yeah, probably, but don't forget Saruman. Right? He began to take an interest in the Shire before Mordor. Mary, yeah, but you're going to be with us. Everything will be fine. Look at Gandalf's response. Always blows me away that Tolkien does this. 
I am with you at present, but soon I shall not be. I'm not coming to the Shire. You must settle its affairs yourselves. That is what you have been trained for. Now that, to me, sounds like Gandalf is saying, all the adventures you've been on over the last year, several months, are all for one purpose. To prepare you to go back and do what needs to be done. Okay. Keep in mind, what are Merry and Pippin at this point? Merry is a knight of Rowan. Pippin is a knight of Gondor. What else about them? What's changed with them in the last year? They're a lot taller. They're a lot taller because they've been drinking the Ent draft, Ent beer, you know. What else? Is Pippin the flighty, you know? Not anymore. They've both been through battle and have changed because of it. Do you not yet understand my time? It is no longer my task to set things to rights, nor to help folk to do so. Why? Why was he a steward, and for how long, or when did his stewardship end? He was there to fight Sau Sauron. The wizards, their entire purpose is to be a counterweight to Sauron. Mm -hmm. Sauron's gone. Gandalf's not the only one who's going to leave. The other remaining wizards will leave also. He says, no, time for you. You're grown up now. Grown indeed very high. He says, what am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to have a talk with Tom Bombadil. A talk like I haven't had, he says, in all my time. Kind of interesting, because Gandalf's been around for thousands of years, and I think he's probably going to go, who are you, master? And I have no idea what Tom's going to say. Then we get the scouring of the Shire. And remember, Tolkien said this chapter was thought of, planned out, before, like 1938, before there is any inkling of a World War II. Okay? We're not going to talk about the battles and all that kind of stuff. Okay? We're going to jump to the very end. In 1018, they get to... Bagshot Row, the row Frodo lived on, lived on. They get to number four, Bagshot Row, which is Bag Inn, Frodo's home. And who do they meet? Sharky, Saruman. Where's Lotho? Missing. Saruman implies what happened to Okay, but how? He's getting killed. Keep going. And Wormtongue was hungry. Mm -hmm. He implies Wormtongue ate him because of being so hungry. Okay? So, 1018, Frodo says, you can leave. Not going to hurt you, etc. 1019. The hobbits want to kill him. Frodo says, uh, Sarah Man says, kill him, kill him if you think there are enough of you. You cannot touch me, etc. And Frodo says, don't believe him. He has lost all power, save his voice, etc. Sarah Man calls Wormtongue out, says, come. What does Frodo offer Wormtongue? Mercy. He says, you don't have to go with him. You haven't done anything. You haven't attempted to do anything with me or to me. And that's when he says, oh, really? Where is Lotho? Okay, that's not to Frodo personally, but Lotho is what to Frodo? Cousin. Remember up here that fourfold ethic? Duty to Lord, duty to kin, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin? He's kind of got a duty to avenge. Sarah Man tries to stab Frodo, 1019. Sam stops him, and Frodo says, Do not kill him even now, for he has not hurt me, and in any case, I do not wish him to be slain in this evil mood. Frodo doesn't say, I do not wish him to be slain. 
Do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment, Gandalf said. He was great once of a noble kind that we should not dare to raise our hands against. Frodo is saying, we don't have the right. It's not our right to pass judgment on one such as him. He is fallen and his cure is beyond us. But... Notice the transformation of Frodo from the second... Oh, I never... <laughs> is that really? Yes, it is. From the second chapter of the first book to the second to the last chapter of the last book. Notice the parallelism. He deserves death, too. I hope he finds his cure. Sarah Mann. You have grown, Halfling. You have grown very much. You are wise and cool. Question? I was going to ask if, since he's no longer a wizard, if he will be able to wizard this and stuck. No, he's stuck. Because okay. Gandalf cast him from the order. So he'll have to live out his days, you know. He says, wise and cruel. He takes for cruelty what Frodo offers as mercy. What's he want? There's a phrase that kind of describes this. Frodo's not a cop. Suicide by cop. He wants to be killed, I think. And Frodo says, no, make him live. Okay? Who kills him? Wormtongue. Wormtongue does. And then Wormtongue's killed. What happens to Saruman? Kind of like when Obi-Wan Kenobi gets killed, you know? Just the cloak, because the body disappears. Why? Because he's not like us. He's not one of us. Okay? Gray Havens. Page 1025. Sam comes into the room, and Frodo's sitting there in pain. And says, I'm wounded. Wounded, it will never really heal. He gets up, turns him to pass. He's fine the next day. Sam remembers, oh, yesterday was October the 6th. Two years ago, what happened to Frodo on October the 6th? He got the stab wound from the Dark Lord, from the um, Captain of the Nine. So, the ring is destroyed, Sauron is destroyed, but Frodo still bears the wounds. And then every March, I don't remember the exact day, Every March before the 15th, Frodo's also sick. From what? Shelob's bite. Okay. Plus, he's always walking around like this. They don't magically grow finger back. 1026, Sam and Rosie have a baby. Little Eleanor, named after the white flowers in Lothlorien. And in 1029, Frodo tells Sam he's going to the Grey Havens. Sam doesn't understand why. Frodo says. And Sam, he tells Sam, you'll get to come too one day. You were a ring bearer too. Don't be sad. Sam, but I thought you were going to the Shire too for years and years after all you've done. What does Sam think Frodo's going to get? What kind of story that they talked about in the middle of the tower of, of the walkway up to Kirith Uncle. One the one where the people in the story call it a good story. So thought I too once, but I have been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. And he says, it must often be so. Someone has to give things up, lose them so that others may keep them. Boromir, Merry and Pippin. And it's probably a stretch, but part of me thinks, I haven't resolved this yet, Gollum, <laughs> or the whole world. Okay? So, who do they meet at the Grey Havens? Who else is there? Elrond. Elrond. Galadriel. Galadriel, Celeborn. Gandalf, Bilbo, 
Bilbo is now past the old Took, so he's the oldest living hobbit. Who else? Merry and Pippin. Why? Because Gandalf didn't want Sam to ride home alone. It could be because, you know, Gandalf says, oh, by the way, Frodo's going off. You know, you might want to say goodbye. That's not what's said in the book. It's, it's so that Sam doesn't have to ride home that few days all by himself. Gandalf's thinking the power of friendship. And then notice the very end. They rode over the downs, took the east road, last page, 1031. Then Mary and Pippin rode on to Buckland. Already they were singing again as they went. Sam turned to Bywater, came back up the hill. As day was ending once more, he went on, and there was yellow light and fire within. In other words, it's like he turns down his road, and he sees at the end. Yellow light, fire within, and the evening meal was ready, and he was expected. He was expected that very day? How? How did Rosie know? And Rose drew him in. I love that phrase. Because that means like she is standing at the door, waiting for him to pull him into the house. And set him in his chair and put little Eleanor upon his lap. And notice the image of domestic happiness. Well, I'm back. Like Bilbo. No. There and back again. He gets, he gets the happy story within the story. Frodo gets the happy story, the happy ending for those outside. Because where does he go? He goes to get his final year, his full year. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, I will very briefly on Thursday talk a little bit about you know the overarching theme for the course, renunciation of power and all that, relate it to this, and then we'll get into Harry Potter, we'll, we'll talk about it a lot. All right.